Hello and welcome everyone. Um, tonight's topic is the five skandhas, which um, is sort of more of a basic Buddhist teaching. It's one of the fundamental teachings that goes back very early to the beginnings of Shakyamuni Buddha's teaching career. And I kind of wanted to look at this as a topic because I think it's very interesting in that it connects to a lot of the other teachings that we've probably encountered, but typically people don't spend a lot of time on the five skandhas. And maybe you'll understand why at the end of this. Uh, you'll be sorry that we spent a whole night on it, but hopefully not. So what I'm going to try to do is uh, we'll talk a little bit about what they are um, and then show sort of how they connect to other things that we might already be familiar with to other teachings. <clears throat> so to start out, um, the earliest sort, and this depends on you know which way you want to understand the order in which the sutras were given. According to the Tendai schema, the first teaching was actually the Avatamsaka Sutra, the Flower Garland Sutra. So um, the skandhas are used in that text, but the text that's usually cited as the origin of them is the particular one listed here, uh, the Dhamma Chaka Pavatana Sutta. Apologies, that's Pali, and it roughly translates to the setting the wheel of Dharma in motion. So this was the first teaching that Shakyamuni Buddha gave to the five ascetics that he'd been practicing with several, with for several years before his awakening. And at the beginning of this text, he starts out by mentioning that what he has discovered is something he calls the middle way. And he clarifies, and he uses the middle way in a very specific sense, saying that it's the middle way between devotion to pleasure and devotion to self-affliction, or ascetic practices. And he says that using the middle way leads to calm, to direct knowledge, to self-awakening, to unbinding, or to liberation from the cycle of rebirth. And then he goes on to clarify that uh, this middle way that he's talking about is the Noble Eightfold Path that we're familiar with, of right view, right thought or resolve, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. And immediately after this, he explains the Four Noble Truths. And this is where the skandhas actually come in. So, Sorry, Carl. Someone's trying to get in now. Thank you. Thank you. So, quoting from the sutra, and this is uh, Tanisaro Bhikkhu's uh, translation of it, uh, the Buddha says, Now this, monks, is the noble truth of stress, or dukkha, dissatisfaction, etc. He likes to use stress and stress, stressful instead. Birth is stressful, aging is stressful, death is stressful, sorrow, lamentation, pain, distress, and despair are stressful. Association with the unbeloved is stressful, separation from the loved is stressful. <clears throat> Not getting what is wanted is stressful. In short, the five clinging aggregates are stressful, and these clinging aggregates would be the clinging skandhas. So this sort of brings up a question, right? If we can say that the first noble truth is, in short, that the five clinging aggregates are dissatisfactory or something that leads to dukkha, then we should really investigate what these five skandhas are. So what I would like to use is something that's pretty much hard to dispute, which we can say that they're the physical and mental factors that are related to dukkha or dissatisfaction. But if you read some books on Buddhism or, you know, take a lot of basic Buddhism courses, you're actually probably going to hear something more like this, which is that these are the definition of a person. And interestingly enough, uh, Tanisaro Bhikkhu also put together uh, what he calls a study guide on the five skandhas. And reading that, I sort of came across something interesting, which is that this view of the skandhas being the definition of a person he traces back to Theravadan and Sarvastivadin texts dating back to the early Common Era. And he actually disputes this view by saying that throughout the Pali Canon, you don't find a point where the Buddha equates this to being his definition of what a person is. And in fact, there's a reason for that. One of the reasons is that he repeatedly says that labeling and defining things are inherently limiting to our understanding. So we do use these terms to analyze things and to understand them better, but we really don't want to like start saying, oh, this is really what a person is, or oh, this is really what this is, because we're just kind of making the same mistake we already had made in the first place that led to that dissatisfaction. We're coming up with these things and then we're holding on to them. <coughs> the other 
thing that he cites is actually that um, <laughs> this, this insistence on saying that the skandhas define a person is one of the things that led to a problem that many people ask questions about. What is reborn from one lifetime to the next? Originally, this wasn't necessarily a problem because we weren't saying that, you know, the skandhas, which come and go, they arise, they cease, uh, we weren't saying that these things were sort of constituents of a person. They were just sort of seen as mental and physical factors that are related to our suffering. So in that case, you don't necessarily have the same problem. You can imagine whatever you want being reborn from one lifetime to the next. Um, we typically go with, you know, it's the consequences of our actions, the karmic stream that passes from one life to the next. <clears throat> so what I would recommend is that we, at least for the sake of this presentation, just take them at face value, the way that they were presented originally, and we'll just look at the skandhas as skandhas, and I'll leave it up to you how you want to understand, you know, if you see them as the definition of a person or anything like that, but I'm not going there. <laughs> so the first thing that we need to do is look a little bit at... Uh, the terminology that we're using. So the term skanda itself actually means a lot of different things. Uh, one of them is an aggregate, which is the one I tend to use a lot because that's the way I first learned them. Uh, another one is a heap, so you hear people talking about the five heaps. Uh, it can be a bundle, a mass of something, a collection, a grouping, or interestingly enough, the trunk of a tree. Um, I don't actually know exactly why. Um, that's an interesting question for later. But I kind of imagine, you know, if we take something like a snowball, for instance, where, you know, we can roll it around and it gathers up more and more snowflakes and it kind of forms this thing. But it's like, it's a lot of just sort of disparate things that are kind of like hanging together, right? Making something else. And Tanisaro Biko actually uses the image of a pile of bricks, which I like. And he says that, you know, holding onto these skandhas is like we're carrying around this huge pile of bricks with us through our lives, just making things more difficult, you know, for no real reason. <clears throat> so I'm sure you would like to know why the Buddha chose this terminology, and the answer is good. We don't know, because he didn't explain it. <laughs> so, we have to sort of again take this at face value and understand that for some reason, this made sense as a way to try to explain this knowledge that he just gained through his direct experience and insight to these people who had been studying with him for all these years. And so he used this term as the sort of catch-all for these uh, physical and mental components. <clears throat> Another issue that we face a lot is we're usually looking at these texts in translation and many times they've gone through multiple translations. We're looking at an English version of a text that was translated into Chinese from Sanskrit, etc. And one of the sort of casualties here is we lose a lot of the technical terms because people sort of tried to find ways to translate them that they thought made them make sense. So if you go back to the Sanskrit or the Pali, you're going to see the same term used in all of these different cases, and you can connect it. You can say, oh, that's what they're talking about. But in this case, we don't really have that luxury. So I put this table together from just, you know, a few sources I had laying around the house of how people translate these things. So for Rupa, which is the first skanda, you'll often see form or matter, and it's usually fairly consistent. Um, our version of the Heart Sutra uses form, so I'll be sticking with that. Uh, Vedana is sometimes translated as sensation, sometimes as feeling. Feeling's usually the messier translation because we have very different ideas about what feelings are versus this sort of technical term. So I like sensation, and that's also what the Heart Sutra uses. Samjna is uh, sometimes translated as perception. Our version of the Sutra uses conception. Now this is the one that should really jump out at you, is uh, Samskara. And you'll see that people are not really sure how to translate this one. <laughs> and the reason why is going to become pretty clear soon. But you'll see various translations, mental formations, mental constituents. Sometimes people just translate it as volition, which volition is one of the samskaras. Um, volitional constructions, <coughs> constructing activities, conditioned things, karmic activities, and the list goes on. You see a lot of different translations for this. Uh, volition is probably one of the most common ones, and I also see mental formations and mental constituents a lot. The Heart Sutra that we use, interestingly, translates this as discrimination, and I think part of the reasoning for that is it's much more chantable. Uh, 
makes things a lot easier. So if you understand that we're talking about the skandhas in that section, then it's not going to like throw you off when we say discrimination. And then the last one is vijnana, which is consciousness. And it typically is translated as consciousness, but you'll also sometimes see awareness, which is what we use in our version of the Heart Sutra. <clears throat> So with all that in mind, I'm going to stick with mostly the terminology we use in our version of the Heart Sutra, because it'll be more relevant to you because you chant this all the time. So starting out, let's look at what the five aggregates actually are. And the first one is the Rupa aggregate, or the form aggregate. And this is sort of all of the things that are constructed of the various elements. And you'll see it's uh, in the slide it says earth, water, fire, and air. And then also all of the things that are derived from the things made by those elements. So this is probably a large part of your world of experience, right? When they say um, earth, water, fire, and air, this doesn't just literally mean those things. It also applies to the properties of those things. So earth being solidity, water being fluidity, uh, fire being warmth and heat, and air being motion. And so we should also think about it meaning all of the things that are sort of constructed by those things or have those sort of qualities about them. <clears throat> and with that in mind, uh, the things that are derived from them are also considered to be rupa. And this is our various sense organs like our eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind, which you'll hear listed many times. So in short, we could say the form basically refers to the things that are perceived by all of our senses, as well as the sense organs, and that it's the least intuitive for the sense of mind, right, which is there are six senses in Buddhism and the mind is the sixth one. And honestly, the explanations won't really help much there. Um, it gets very abstract. <laughs> but going on from there, things get a lot simpler. The sensation aggregate is uh, Basically, it's the sensations that come about through the contact between those sense faculties and the objects that we're making contact with through those sense faculties. And the thing is, uh, it's very easy to understand because there are really only three sort of permutations of this. From this perspective, things are either pleasant, unpleasant, or neither pleasant nor unpleasant. So it keeps things very simple. This is kind of our knee-jerk reaction. It's not our complicated feelings about things. It's like, oh, you feel the table and it's very smooth and that's like pleasing to you, you know? So keeping that in mind, all of those three categories are then able to be applied to each of our individual senses, which, you know, it's three times six gives you 18 total. But you really just need to know those three. So moving on from those, we get to the conception aggregate. And you'll love this definition. Uh, I took this from Asanga's compendium of the Abhidharma, the Abhidharma Samshaya. And uh, in it, he says that the conception aggregate is what apprehends objects, the unbeing of objects, limited object, extensive object, limitless object, and the base of nothingness in which there are no objects. <laughs> I thought that was kind of confusing, but what it boils down to is essentially um, this is often characterized as our sort of labeling capacity for things, which is why we have this translation of conception. It's we're perceiving something, and this is this is the aggregate that allows us to sort of identify a chair or a tree or something like that. So it's it's the part that labels labels things in that sense. It's, specifically labels the, the sensory perceptions. This one is my favorite one. This is the discrimination aggregate or the samskara aggregate that we were talking about earlier that's sometimes referred to as volition, sometimes the mental concomitants, that's an, another nice one, and the second order mental states, uh, which consist of associated mental functions and then the functions that are considered to be dissociated from the mind. and. The reason people have such a hard time translating this one is that basically everything that doesn't fit into the other four aggregates goes in this category. So it's a huge amount of different things. And what I, what I mean when I say that it's our sort of second order mental states, that's kind of my way of trying to simplify it, is that we have the direct experiences of a form, this perception labeling part of things, the the, the sensations that we have that are pleasant or unpleasant, the kind of knee-jerk reaction, 
This is like more the emotional content. So it's a way wider range of things. Some of them are probably actually pretty surprising, but this is how they were categorized in later Abhidharma texts. And you might remember this uh, diagram that I used for one of my earlier presentations when I was talking about the dharmas in general. And this was a chart of the dharmas as they're divided up in the Sarvastavada and Abhidharma, which is uh, sort of early Mahayana. And you don't need to be able to read them. Uh, it's more just a point of how many there are. Uh, <laughs> So, if we're wanting to find which ones are the samskaras in this, it's basically all of these. So it's pretty much most things. And one of the things that's interesting about their particular list is you'll also see um, some of the skandhas listed in here as samskara as well, like feeling and perception and, uh, and so on. But the main point here being that this is basically the catch-all for everything else, right? And we'll get a little bit clearer on it as we go with some examples. <clears throat> and then the final aggregate that we need to worry about is the awareness aggregate, or the consciousness aggregate, uh, Vijnana. And I have here mind, ideation, and consciousness. And this is sort of the expanded way of understanding it. In its earliest usage, it refers to uh, what people call the cognizing ability of the mind. But what this specifically is, is when you think about sort of Buddhist phenomenology, we have a sense organ, it makes contact with an object, and then a consciousness arises in our mind, and that's, that's our understanding of that object, right? So we have the eye and the thing that it's seeing, and then an eye consciousness arises, and that's sort of our visual image of it. So this is what consciousness originally referred to in, in, with respect to the aggregate. And so there were six of them, one for each of the senses, and they were sort of independent. The mind sense, uh, the mind consciousness part of the consciousness aggregate being the one that sort of integrates them all into, into experience that's coherent for us. But this was expanded later in the, in the Yogacara Abhidharma, where they sort of broke out these categories and, and expanded it, and that's where we also get uh, mind and ideation being part of it where they still have the same sense of those sense consciousnesses being one part of it, but then they also add the category of mind in the respective citta, which is basically when we talk about the storehouse consciousness, which we don't need to go like super deep into that, but that's like the, the place where sort of the, the seeds of all of the habituated actions you do reside in the mind. And then beyond that, there's also um, one translation is ideation, uh, it's the manas, the manas consciousness. And this is, uh, Asanga is, refers to it as like sort of deliberating and appraising mind associated with the sense of self and also with ignorance in the Buddhist sense. But yeah, I typically think about it in terms of, it's mostly about the sort of very core level of the part of our mind that sees us as an independent self. So, with all of that stuff in mind, I gave you a handout so that you can look back at these definitions later and puzzle through when you go through examples. It's too hard to follow because I know it's hard to kind of like remember what all of these are. <clears throat> so moving on from here, this is kind of my favorite part of this to think about, which is where it starts to connect to other teachings. <clears throat> and the, same, the example that we started off with was actually the Four Noble Truths, right? That the first truth is uh, about the fact that clinging to the skandhas is the source of dukkha. It's trying to hold on to all of these things, right? Those, those five skandhas. Well, one of the places that you would most likely see it introduced is with the concept of anatman, or non-self, as it's often translated. And there are at least several texts where this comes up, where the Buddha goes through the various aggregates, and he points out how people who don't have a clear understanding see themselves in the form aggregate, or they see themselves in the sensation aggregate. And the reality is, they're just kind of these five things that are happening. And if you really examine them, you can't find any one of the five that really contains you as you see yourself. You're not in there anywhere. It's a sort of illusion. It's almost like a trick that's played on you by the, by the experiences you have of them. Another place that you see them is in the 12 causes. And I actually took this diagram from the presentation I did on that. We're not going to get really deep into what the 12 causes are either, because that was like a whole long presentation. But the general idea of them is it's the chain of dependent origination explaining how we go from a sort of fundamental ignorance 
through the sufferings of birth, old age, and death. One of the things that we miss out on by not using the, the sort of Sanskrit or Pali terminology is that it's kind of hard to find the skandhas in here, but they're actually all throughout it. So if I start using the actual terminology, there are four of them right there. What was translated as action in the version of these that I was using is actually the samskara aggregate. And consciousness, vijjana, it's the same exact term. Name and form is a little bit different, but it's, it's essentially referring to the same thing in this context. And then you'll notice the six sense organs are separate. Um, they use different terminology for that, but effectively that's still form. And then we also have feeling, but that's the same as sensations, fed enough. So then where are all of these other things? And the answer is that these orange ones are basically ones that you'll find in a large list of the samskaras. Well, that basically left us with two that aren't actually related to the five aggregates, but we already talked about the fact that the six sense organs basically are related to form already. And I would go out on a limb here and say that I think becoming sort of fits into a samskara-ish kind of place, uh, especially if birth and death can. So I'm willing to put them here. And basically, what you'll realize is, if you sort of understand what the five skandhas are or have some intuition about them, that the 12 causes actually make a lot more sense. They're reorganizing the relationship between those things in a linear fashion, so you understand how they work together, the relationship between them that actually leads to that dukkha. So the, the original version is, you know, you say, oh, well, the truth of our dukkha is the clinging aggregates. But then now we can sort of delve deeper into what the relationship is between them and understand how that actually happens. But now we're going to get to my favorite part. I wanted to do this because we recite this every week, and I wanted to point out how much this actually has to do with this topic. So when we recite the Heart Sutra, we begin with Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva doing deep Prajnaparamita, clearly saw emptiness of all five conditions, thus completely relieving misfortune and pain. Those five conditions are the five skandhas. And again, five aggregates is not so chantable. But this is what it's referring to if you go look at the, the Sanskrit that it's, that it's based on. <clears throat> o Shariputra, form is no other than emptiness, emptiness no other than form, Form is exactly emptiness, emptiness exactly form. This is all referring to the aggregate of form, rupa. But I also wanted to point out, keep in mind that formula. Form is no other than emptiness, emptiness no other than form. Form is exactly emptiness, emptiness is exactly form. Because this is the core of the Prajnaparamita teaching that the Heart Sutra is conveying. This is how Avalokiteshvara has eliminated pain, right? So next we get the familiar remaining four. Sensation, conception, discrimination, awareness are likewise like this. And that's shorthand, right? The Heart Sutra is very condensed and very brief, but what it's saying is uh, essentially the exact same formula we had. Sensation is no other than emptiness, emptiness no other than sensation. Sensation is exactly emptiness, emptiness exactly sensation. For all of them. O Shariputra, all dharmas are forms of emptiness. Now this form is not talking about the aggregate though. <laughs> Just to confuse you. Not born, not destroyed, not stained, not pure, without loss, without gain. These are actually samskara. So in emptiness, there's again our familiar list. No form, no sensation, conception, discrimination, awareness. Those are again our five aggregates. No eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, mind, the sense organs. No color, sound, smell, taste, touch, phenomena. Those are the things that they perceive. So in that aspect, it's referring to form. But then also, because these are gone, we're eliminating the sensation of pleasant, unpleasant, or neither that's associated with our perception of them, as well as the sort of conception part where we're labeling those things based on what we're, what we're perceiving. No realm of sight, no realm of consciousness. This is talking about the sense consciousnesses. It's actually shorthand, it just has the first one and the last one, of sight and then consciousness or awareness. But in reality, this is referring to the ones for all of those six senses. 
No ignorance and no end of ignorance. No old age and death, no end to old age and death. Again, samskaras. No suffering, no cause of suffering, no extinguishing, no path. Four Noble Truths in the Eightfold Path. No wisdom and no gain. And this part is just beautiful to me because it very much echoes that original teaching, the first, the, the first turning of the wheel of the Dharma. Except now we're using Prajnaparamita to accomplish the same thing instead of doing the analysis the opposite direction. We're using this all-powerful concept we've learned as Mahayana Buddhists of Shunyata. And now we, we even go back to, well, in a, substan in a substantive sense, there are no Four Noble Truths or no Eightfold Path because we've cut through the clinging aggregates. It's no longer there. There's no longer a problem to solve. We've seen through it. And this finally, you know, gets us further into it. No gain and thus the Bodhisattva lives Prajnaparamita with no hindrance in the mind, no hindrance, therefore no fear, far beyond deluded thoughts. This is Nirvana. In other words, it's accomplished right there. All past, present, and future Buddhas live Prajnaparamita and therefore attain Anuttara Samyak Sambhavi or Supreme Perfect Awakening. So basically the first two-thirds of the Heart Sutra are all about the skandhas. So I really wanted that to be pointed out just because we often lose those terms because we're not using the Sanskrit or the Pali or something like that. But in the original it is using those technical terms as it's going through them. So with this in mind, I just had a few reflections uh, that I had from working on this, and one of them is I really want to, you know, hammer this fact home that I feel like the skandhas are sort of the glue that holds a lot of the a lot of the different numbered Buddhist teachings together. You can find them over and over, and the more sutra you read, it's hard sometimes because of the translation, and they're not using the same terms from one to the next. Sometimes they go with things that read more easily, etc. So it can be kind of hard to find them, but if you really study the skandhas a little bit and get a good handle on them, you'll start recognizing them all over the place. And what you'll find out is pretty soon you can't open a Buddhist text without seeing them there. Basically, no matter where you look, it's the five skandhas. <laughs> Another thing I wanted to point out is that I think it's really important for us to always focus on the fundamentals when we're thinking about studying, studying Buddhist doctrine. So, for instance, the five skandhas are a very foundational teaching. But I'm talking about just, in general, thinking about some of those basic numbered teachings and getting to where you really know them. Because those were originally presented as a complete path, and then more stuff was added on as time went on. And really understanding those helps you understand more complicated things because everything is built up from those foundations. From, from the, the teachings of the Deer Park on, everything is building on it. You'll find one sutra that introduces the concept, and another one clarifies it. And another one comes at it from a different direction, etc. So your understanding kind of grows if you already have that base of understanding the fundamentals well enough that you're not, you know, having to look at the handout every time. Yeah. And the other thing is, I think it's really important that when we look at teachings like the skandhas, I mean, they still feel kind of abstract. I mean, they're trying to, like, take experience and break it up into five sort of categories and then doing things with those categories. So one of the most important things I think for us to do with, you know, even a teaching like this that's more straightforward, as well as the more complicated ones, is to try and when we're studying them, connect them to our actual experience. Like, I don't know, I might be kind of weird for this, but you know, when you touch the table, it's like, yeah, what is the sensation, right? Was that pleasant, unpleasant, or not? I mean, I'm registering that in theory, but I'm not actively thinking about how I feel about something and how that changes how I react to it or how it changes what sort of second order thoughts I have about it. Like, I mean, maybe, you know, I'm unpleasant, I'm rubbing on this table while something else is going on. And it's just increasing my unpleasantness. <laughs> Suddenly I'm getting mad at somebody who's, you know, trying their best. I don't even know where the source of it is. And then once you've sort of gone through some of this process, it's great to always go back and revisit the stuff that you had a hard time with originally, and you'll start to see a lot of sort of deeper meanings in it once you have a handle on the sort of, on the basics, right, that it's built up from. So once you have a deeper understanding of something like the skandhas, then you go back and you look at the Heart Sutra, and suddenly it's like there are two-thirds of the sutras just talking about those. It's almost a direct response to the first teaching that the, that the Buddha did. It's giving us a new new method, you know, a different way of looking at it, a different way of understanding it. 
but you know, a lot of those things are easy to miss when you know you read a difficult text one time and you suffer through it, and then that's the end of it, and you never really go back to it. So I would encourage you know, kind of go about those things cyclically. You know, don't just spend a lot of time trying to really delve into something deep because it's just you just get bogged down. Speaking from experience, there. <laughs> so with that, uh, this poor guy is carrying around some skandhas. <laughs> But he doesn't look too bothered. Do you want Ichishima Sensei? First, uh, I would like to ask if Ichishima Sensei, if you have anything that you would like to say. Oh, thank you. Uh, this uh, five standards is a very essential program, which Saramani Buddha uh, really uh, understood. And uh, I think, you know, very life. We can see our phenomena. These phenomena are supposed to be five skandhas, consisting of five skandhas. They are all nothing but emptiness or sunyata. And sunyata is supposed to be maybe noumena and uh, relationship between, uh, uh, what shall I say, uh, zero and one, zero to one, one to zero. This is a basis of, uh, uh, I think, computer. Uh, According to Steve Jobs, he really mentioned emptiness uh, as zero and uh, uh, skandhas uh, one. So zero to one is a basic concept. Uh, I think uh, in, uh, in such you know computer system, he said. I think this is great awakening, and he also uh, made a. Uh, what shall I say? iPhone, everybody uses now. This iPhone system is, uh, you know, <clears throat> zero to one. And zero is supposed to be, he says, crowd. Instead of uh, sunyata, he says, crowd. So e everything we uh, ask, you know, uh, no, uh, but uh, uh, sky or, and then, we can, uh, 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 what shall I say, reflect those fundamental element of noumena to phenomenal world. So I think uh, these are uh, nothing different from present and past. And uh, I think five skandhas is very basic ideas of uh, Buddhism. And uh, Sanskrit term skandhas generally aggregates but uh, I found another uh, sutra, like Anikaba Sutra, there are mentions uh, in places uh, among six directions Buddhas. Uh, I think uh, south and north and the upper world of Buddha, there, there, there is a name of the Enkenbutsu, uh, Arichi Skanda. Archi, Maha uh, Archi Skanda. Maha, it means great. Archi is a fire. And Skanda, uh, according to Kumarajiba, translators of Chinese, uh, he said uh, Skandas for uh, our shoulders. I think uh, while, uh, you know, uh, the translator Kumarajiba, peace century, uh, there, are, there are lots of tape uh, uh, in describing the, uh, you know, fires from the shoulders. So uh, this is a reflection of the, uh, I think, the Zoroaster, uh, the fire worship of the region in the central Asia. So uh, King Kanishka really he was, um, of course, a member of the such, you know, Zoroaster. But according to Zoroaster Sutra, uh, Zoroaster system, you know, uh, only choices, heaven or uh, what's it, hell, hell and heaven. So if you do thus uh, bad things or killing persons, absolutely you go to hell. Uh, so she was so surprising about that, and uh, but he noticed uh, um, Buddha's teaching that uh, 
even you did have seen. You really reflect yourself and then uh, and say, Namo Buddhaya, Namo Amitabha, you know, Namo Buddhaya, then you go to heaven. So uh, she really likes that and she converts from Zoroaster to Buddhist. Uh, and uh, I think uh, this is very interesting. Please uh, find three terms uh, of the Maha Aruchi Skanda in Amitabha Buddhas. In that case, instead of aggregates, he translated uh, shoulder. Because in the Sanskrit dictionary, there is uh, such as a uh, translation shoulders for aggregates, you know, um, scandals. So mm -hmm. this is my comment. Thank you uh, for your presentation. Thank you, Thank you very much. much. Thanks so much. All right. So with that, we'll um, stop the recording.